how can you differentiate? How could we stand out among the competition, among the hospitals that have the big dollars? Hello, welcome to the Better Outcomes Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Each episode, we bring you a conversation with leaders across the healthcare industry, exploring topics ranging from new treatment techniques and interventions to novel service delivery methods and business models. And now your host, Rafi Salazar from Rehab U Practice Solutions, a leader in patient engagement and retention strategy. Let's explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Well, hello again. Welcome to another episode of the Better Outcome Show. I'm your host, Rafi Salazar with Rehab U Practice Solutions. This week, we are diving into technology, the world of technology and how it has the ability to act as a force multiplier for clinicians the world over. That sounds really pie in the sky, doesn't it? <laughs> well, this probably comes at a pretty decent time, just given the recent news and coverage about things like chat GPT and things like that that you've been seeing around the interwebs. This is at the time of this recording, January 25th, 2023. And I don't know about you, but every time I log in to LinkedIn or social media of any kind or the internet in general, I'm getting flooded with information and posts about what chat GPT can't do, what it can do, the things that artificial intelligence is going to take take off our plate or what it's going to replace and what it's going to do for us and, and all of that kind of thing. And it can be very concerning for people in healthcare and the service-based industry, people that use their brains a lot for thinking and for working, uh, to really discern kind of how do we use this technology? Is it going to be something that takes like healthcare, for example, which is a very human interaction, a very human experience? And is it going to be, is artificial intelligence, the technology going to be something that ends up removing the human element from care or can it be used in a way that facilitates real patient centeredness while also streamlining efficiency and all of that, right? Like what's the point of having this technology if we're not going to use it to improve clinical outcomes, but we want to be able to improve clinical outcomes in a way that still makes the human element or the human experience felt throughout the treatment process and the assessment and consultation process. So my guest this week is Dr. Harvey Castro. He's a physician, board certified ER physician. And we talked a little bit about his previous uh, career, his medical career, because he has one of those guys that's just done a little bit of everything. He's pretty interesting to talk to. So he was at one point in time had something like 30 apps in the the Apple uh, iPod store or whatever. And he ultimately went on to start his private ER, standalone ER system. And they ended up, I think his stake in it all was seven ER facilities, total freestanding ER facilities. He ended up selling those. So we talked a little bit about building the organization to sell. We talked a little bit about training healthcare staff, clinicians, physicians to be truly patient-centered in the way that the system or the process of care was set up. And then we also talked about the just the process of selling to a, a private equity firm or PE firm and kind of what that meant post-sale for him. And, and then we talked about what he's doing now. So he recently wrote a book called Chat, GPT, and Healthcare. It's available on Amazon, and we will link to it in the show notes. And we talked primarily about the technology itself and its potential benefits for clinicians, boots on the ground clinicians that are treating patients every day in the clinic, whether it be an ER, whether it be another uh, some kind of specialty clinic or area. And hopefully, because I have not been one of those people that keeps up all that much with, I see technology when it pops up here and there, I kind of look at it and say, oh, maybe that's got some, some legs and we can see. But I feel like something like this, this chat GPT, this artificial intelligence has really been kind of almost accelerating in the the amount of coverage it's getting on the news and in the media. And I figured it was good to talk to somebody who's 
Well, you literally wrote a book on it <laughs> specifically for healthcare. So hopefully this conversation uh, provides a little bit of insight, uh, provides a little bit a little bit of explanation about what the technology is in particular and how it can potentially be used. Um, and then again, give you a little bit of just some information about what to look at and things to think about kind of coming down the pipe, so to speak, insofar as technology and artificial intelligence and its role in the clinical setting, as well as its effect on patient experience, patient engagement, et cetera. So without further ado, here is Dr. Harvey Castro talking about all sorts of things, healthcare business, but really rounding it out with uh, his recent book, Chat GPT and Healthcare. Well, hey, Dr. Castro, welcome to the show. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing great. How about yourself? I'm doing wonderful. I'm looking forward to sitting and talking with you about patient experience and using that to build your business and then maybe even some technology. But before we do that, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and then what got you into doing what you're doing now? So my name is Dr. Harvey Castro. I'm a board certified ER physician. Um, but I feel like uh, it's hard to describe what I do or what my past because I've done a little bit of everything. I've done things as far as I uh, created my own vitamin company. At one point, I had over 30 iPhone apps and a consultant for uh, medical apps. Later, I decided I was going to have my own business and created my own, uh, I call it my own mini healthcare, where I had my own billing company, staffing company, uh, and emergency rooms. Uh, and then the latest, uh, I'm also an author. I wrote a book recently called Chat GPT in Healthcare or and Healthcare. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we we connected because we were talking about building those ERs and um, you ended up building what? You had nine of them all together and then you sold them, right? Yeah. So I had, uh, honestly, I've built over 20, but I put <laughs> seven under one brand. Yeah. <laughs> So I I did it for other people, and when I realized, hey, I I, I understand this business well, uh, let me do my own name and my own business per se. Uh, so that was good. Yeah. And what specifically kind of drove you into doing that? Because I mean, as a doctor, you could do a lot of things, right? You could have your own private practice. You could, uh, you know, be a consultant for you know medical expert stuff. So what drove you specifically into like I want to do standalone? ER rooms? You know, looking back, I, I think I've always wanted to do things outside the box. I've always wanted to not go with the norm. Uh, when I was working in a hospital system, to answer your question, I was not happy. Um, I, I signed up to be a doctor, but when I was in the ER, I quickly realized that they were pushing me to see patients faster than I really wanted to. Not that I was slow in any way. I was average with the other docs, but they were really on me about uh, seeing if I could increase my productivity and that would be by patients and encounters. And I just thought, man, I'm a doctor first. And now you're pushing me like a number for others. And I, I just couldn't swallow that pill. And so the freestanding market, ironically, I, I live in um, Dallas, Texas. One of the first uh, freestandings in the world was built literally in my neighborhood. And I saw that company rise and they, I think they ended up with like 60 or 70 ERs around the United oh, wow. States. Um, and then I decided, you know what? I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit ER. And I remember my, uh, I was actually one of the owners of the ER company and the company at the people at the top are like, Harvey, you're crazy. Do you realize there's only like a handful of us and we're, we're getting paid well and, and you're willing to give this up. And I was like, yeah, it's, it's not worth it. I would come home so tired. I, I remember the, the, the breaking point was me seeing about 90 patients in 12 hours by oh, myself. Holy smokes. And after that, I was like, I, I can't do this. Uh, I can't be like <laughs> in my fifties later, sixties and, and do this. There's no way. So luckily for me, I decided to start a free standalone ER. Yeah. And then what were the biggest kind of challenges or lessons you learned starting that? Cause I'm sure going from, you know, a lot of people do this, right. Especially clinicians or, or technical experts, right? Like we have this craft, if you would, we have this expertise and we're like, I can do this for myself. And we go out into business and we learn all kinds of stuff. Like there's a whole back end that's, that's getting done without us or the marketing and sales engine or managing people and, and all of that. So moving from, 
okay, you had that you were working in a hospital or in an ER, and then you're starting your own practice. Kind of what was the biggest lesson you learned doing that? Like kind of bootstrapping this thing and building it from the ground up. You know, I think uh, I'm probably naive in the sense that I'm always optimistic about everything. And, oh, yeah. and that na being naive sometimes was an advantage because <laughs> I didn't realize some of the things I was going into. With that said, uh, one of the things I could give others as an advice is you can't stay stagnant. How I practice medicine when I was a medical student does not reflect residency. And then that does not reflect my first few years. And then that does not reflect who I am today. So my number one advice is you have to be able to move and change. You have to accept change. Most people hate change and will stay in bad relationships, will do things that don't make sense because they, they just do not want to change. So my number one advice is going into the business, be able to pivot. If you're not able to pivot, you're going to fail. And yeah. so going into that business, I, even when I first started to what it became later, it was so different uh, because we had to pivot. Yeah. Cool deal. And so you ended up growing these things. Like you said, you, you built 20, but seven were under one brand. How did part of the, the reason for your move, right, was because you wanted to offer a higher level of care and customer or patient experience and engagement was very important. So how did that piece, the whole patient service, patient experience, patient engagement play a role, one, in the success of the business, but then just in kind of building it and the culture that you put together at these standalone ERs? Well, you hit it right there. The, the, the magic word in all these things is culture. You know, you can go into any business and they can, like, well, just use healthcare. You can go to any ER in the United States and, and it's a certain type of care. How can you differentiate? How could we stand out among the competition, among the hospitals that have the big dollars? And so one of the things we did is we turned everything over towards the patient. We said, you know what? It's not about the doctor. It's not about the ER. It's about the patient. And I know that sounds cliche-ish and everybody says that, but let me give you a true example. Um, we changed the culture so that we educated everyone from the front door to the back, every person that dealt with the patient to be keep that in mind that the patient was first. And I think the best example was um, this was not in our protocols. This isn't something we did, but one of the radiology techs decided to do this. And this is a quick story. Patient came in, um, it was a child, broke his ankle. Um, the triage uh, at the time was the radiology tech, took him straight to the uh, x-ray, called the doctor, called the nurse. Everybody gathered at the x-ray while the patient was at the x-ray, got the medication for pain meds, got the x-ray, obviously it was broken, splinted the patient, did the consult there, talked to the specialist, had the appointment, and then the parents, by the time they went home, everything was in one, in one place. Instead of telling the story in the front office and then the ER and then the yeah. radiology tech, it was one time. And, and that was the culture that was built. And so that's why people just love coming to us because they knew we were going to do whatever it took to make it right. Yeah. And what specific, because I'm obviously you're getting clinicians, unless you're getting them fresh out of school or something like that, where they, they might still be like, have this ideal of healthcare. Odds are you're picking people up who have worked in other clinics or work in other hospitals. And they're used to kind of this industrial kind of fee-for-service model of, of healthcare, like you said, where there's a lot of productivity and a lot of just drive for operational efficiency. So you had to take these doctors, these clinicians, and train them how to interact in a very patient-first way. What were some of those key points that you wanted to convey to them as you were onboarding them onto your team? Like, this is how we do it at, you know, this, this ER, these are some of the things you want to keep in mind. Like, what were those key points you were trying to instill in these staff members as they were joining the team? Yeah, you know, the, you hit it right on. We, we had to do a course. We actually required physicians before they touched the patient to go through a course. And so every month we would have a course. And, and in that course, what we taught we didn't teach any medicine because, uh, you know, state, I'm in Texas, the state of Texas board made sure that those doctors knew medicine. We taught them how to have better bedside manners. And we basically went through case studies uh, of patients in the past that may have complained of X and Y and how we could have done things better. Common things being common, um, doctors, unfortunately, uh, felt rushed and they wouldn't spend time with the patient. 
communication was an issue. So we spent a time, a lot of time telling them, hey, we need to communicate with our patients. The example that I gave of group triage, we enforced that to make sure that those were the things. And then the ER, unfortunately, uh, because of the volume, uh, doctors are taught to get patients in and get them right out. Yeah. And so we did the reverse. <laughs> we were telling, no, no, no. We can tell by the time the patient was in the ER, if they wanted to be in and out, that's one thing. But I, this patient felt like it was rushed. So we would look at their times to make sure the opposite, that they were there long enough, you know? Yeah. And then was there, like, I'm assuming since y'all are freestanding, like, how much work was done on the administrator of the back end to make sure there was a continuity of care? Because these patients are coming into you, but they might be going to their you know, PCP or you know, another specialist down the road. Like, were there extra steps that you put in place to make sure that they, on the continuity side, that once they left you, they weren't just kind of dangling in the winds? <laughs> oh, that's, that's an excellent point. Um, we actually always made sure to follow up with our patients in two ways. One, if it was deemed appropriate where the patient needed to see a specialist right away, we would make the appointment for the patient. Oh, wonderful. And so while they were in the ER, we would say, okay, Dr. X is going to meet you at this time. If it was in the middle of the night, we would say, hey, the office opens at this time. Let us call and make this appointment. Give us some slots and see if we can do it for you. And so we would do that. On top of that, we would, if the patient was uh, really, really sick, but was okay to go home, then we would call them the same day just to see how they're doing. If not, our protocol was that within 48 hours, we would call every single patient. Yeah. Okay. So you, you were doing, you were going above and beyond what they would get basically any, anywhere else, unless you're going to one of these big hospital systems. And even then it's like, oh, well, that department will call you whenever you get discharged. Right. right? Yeah, exactly. And that's my point. That was the culture that we instilled and we empowered people in the front desk and the back to do whatever it needed to be done for the patient. A lot of big hospitals, if you want to change, I know when I worked for a big hospital system, if I wanted to change a protocol or something, I literally would have to go to the regional person, or sometimes I had to go to nationals. And I'm yeah. like, get it. It'll be three months from now. By then, you know, it won't matter <laughs> or something. So uh, that was the beauty. We we really empowered everybody, and we just told them just do the right thing. And believe it or not, um, they they did. And and it's kind of seemed like a simple thing to tell people, but at the big hospital system, there's a lot of red tape, and they can yeah. do a lot of things. We were giving patients food, uh, coats in the winter. Uh, homeless would come in. We would, you know, give them things. And uh, I remember getting the, uh, uh, what is it, the owner of the building, like, <laughs> called and saying, hey, you need to stop feeding the homeless and you need to stop giving them <laughs> stuff because they're making it worse for the other tenants around you. And I was like, well, we're a healthcare system. You know, I'm a doctor. We're, we're here. Yeah, we're help. helping people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that big point about red tape, especially in big hospitals. So I did five year, a five-year stint at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I mean, some of those things, like if you wanted to change one little protocol, sometimes it was literally an act of Congress. So yeah, empowering yeah. people to make those changes is, is awesome. Yeah. I was in the army, so I can relate. <laughs> oh yeah. I was there. <laughs> yeah, it's rank and file for sure. So um, we talked the other day and you said you you took these seven clinics, you rolled them up, and you you sold them at the end and now you're doing what you're doing now so when you were building this practice was the intention always to sell or was this one of those like oh man it's kind of just building and growing and now in order for it to hit the next level it needs some capitalization so we're going to sell it or or were you thinking at the beginning i'm going to build these this business build some value in it and then exit i always describe myself as a chess player i'm always looking long term <laughs> Uh, and anything I do from day one, I'm already looking at the last day or trying my best to look at the last day. As much as I knew I didn't want to give up, uh, this was my little baby. In my mind, I knew that the greater good was uh, for it to continue growing. Um, so every time we strategically opened another location or spot or anything in the business, even protocols or standardization of the business we made sure to do it so that in the day you know in the future if we were gone it was it was kind of already all running and, and well set up yeah yeah did you have you ever read that book built to sell i think john warlow wrote it no i don't yeah. i love reading so yeah it's well it's a it's a quick read it's like maybe 150 pages but it's a yeah. He puts it as a it's a, a fictional story but he, it's walking this business owner through wanting to sell his business um and he, the basic idea is like, well, you build it in a way that it is valuable, right? <laughs> like you're putting the pieces in place along the way to make it a sellable asset instead of one of those, especially in service-based industries, 
like healthcare, it's like, oh, if the main doctor leaves, sometimes that practice just implodes, right? Yeah, <laughs> right? yeah so true. So, so, so I've seen that. <laughs> <laughs> um, specifically with with the selling of that business, how did you how did you go about that? Did you get a broker involved? Did you just have contacts in, in the space that you knew were looking at? Because I think you sold it to a PE firm, right? Yeah, I ironically, yes, the answer is yes to everything you yes just to said. All. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the company that had invested in in the in all the ERs asked if they could basically take over and 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 we you know it's a lot easier since it's already all in house to do that. Yeah. Um, so you know, in a way, I feel like I I lucked out because instead of um, looking and doing all that, it just it takes forever. It's not yeah. just you weren't shopping this business around. It was kind of like a, a ready made solution there. Yeah, and and again, I think it was the end in mind. Yeah. Um, now looking forward, I'm, I'm, I love this space, so, but now I'm trying to do more on the digital healthcare space and, and that's kind of where I'm, my time is spent now. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk about that. Cause you're, you're working now as a consultant with technology and virtual care, just, I guess at the beginning, let's just talk a little bit about the book. What is the book about? I mean, obviously we know what, what, well, you should know at this point what chat GPT is, but for those who don't know, what is it? So think of it as a, 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 if it's even hard for me to think about it because it does so much, but think of it as a computer just answering your questions, but better than Google, but customizing it. So for example, if God forbid you have, uh, I'm going to make something up, you have diabetes and you need to better control how to take care of your diabetes, a lot of it is diet. And so you could literally type into chat TPT, I need um, the, a low glycemic diet and give me the food and create a grocery list. And then I need a meal plan and it'll create all these things. My advice to on, in the book and now is whatever chat GPT tells you, especially when it comes to healthcare, run it by your provider. I know that sounds lame. The problem is- <laughs> The lawyers um, are happy now you said it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, exactly. <laughs> um, but, but my whole goal of the book is how can we use this tool and how can we better our health? And so my goal was to, in a way, I kind of rushed the book. And it was hard to write because I'm like, okay, who am I? Who's my audience? Is it, you know, these techie people that already know everything? Or is it these doctors that may not know much? Or could be the opposite. They know more than me. And so my goal with all this was, let me get the subject out. Let me just talk about it and let the leaders uh, drive the conversation and let the patients as well drive the conversation. Because my goal with the book, it was no financial gain. I don't have a company or anything for this. My goal was literally, let's get this conversation going. Let's get these leaders and patients saying, hey, I want X. And then let the leaders create those products for the patients. Because fast forward in the future, patients are going to have better care. And that's yeah. literally why I wrote this book. Yeah. Yeah. I think especially for the we were talking a, a couple of days ago, like in the ancillary healthcare space where I'm at, physical therapists, occupational therapists, places where and, and specialties where a lot of the their business models essentially are recurring care and recurring visits and all that. There's almost this fear on the part of practitioners. Like, I don't want to even begin thinking about something like using artificial intelligence to begin customizing things for my patients because then what am I going to do, right? And there's, there is a fear in, in the healthcare community that, man, the robots are going to take over and there's not going to be a role for clinicians. But, you know, as you, as you have pointed out, right, there's always going to be a role for people in healthcare, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, though, I, I, as far as I can see, I mean, I always think there's, uh, there's always going to have to be that human to human touch. Yeah. Uh, and there's a lot of ethics out there talking about will these AI robots uh, or chat box get to the point where patients don't want to see a doctor. They, they're too embarrassed. They'd rather talk to a robot because they know no one really knows what's going on. With that said, I feel like there's always going to be space. I think if anything, we're going to be able to do more for our patients and more fun stuff and educate. I feel like this platform lends itself for uh, prevention medicine and for education. And so, for example, um, I'll use a diabetes example again. If you don't know much about it, yeah, you can Google it. But to have the ability to type in and say, hey, I'm a 50-year-old male and, and XYZ, you know, what are the best steps to take? You know, it's just powerful to have that customized. Obviously, you're going to give it to your doctor right afterwards. But still, 
that power is huge. Unfortunately, doctors don't have time to spend as much as they could with you. And so having this ability, having the way I see the future is I go in, I, I hear the prompts and then I bring it to my doctor and they're like, yeah, yeah, check, check, check. Oh, I disagree with this. And then it's more of a conversation, but then all the, the bones are already in the paper. Um, and I think fast forward in the future, I do see a future where um, you go to your doctor's website and, and a bot will go through your personalized care with you and kind of go through everything. And then the doctor will kind of look and verify those data points and say, yep, I agree, uh, take it into action. So uh, I'm excited. I, I really think we're going to have better healthcare. I really do. It's just a matter of time now. Yeah, no, I'm a, I'm a big proponent of technology. I always think that if we, th if we think about it as almost a force multiplier, right? Like it's something that's taking our limited capacity because there's only so many hours in a day. There's only so many patients that you can touch in a given time frame. If you have something like this, that's like you said, like a chat bot that is going through a patient's individualized story, getting all the information, and then they're able to sit down with the clinician after that's done. And the clinician and, and the patient are then more having a conversation about, okay, this is what's recommended. Maybe in your case, we do X, Y, Z instead of this. And maybe we swap this out mm -hmm. or change this. So it fits into your lifestyle a little better. Mm -hmm. um, but the idea of like not adopting this technology, I feel like we would, we would do that to our detriment, not just for, for the professions as a whole, the healthcare profession as a whole, but then also for the patients that we, we won't be able to serve, right? Yeah. In my book, I talk about, um, I see a play here for the ER doctor, you know, three, four in the morning, the guy's been up for, you know, 24 hours ish and, um, patient comes in just to be able to have that peripheral brain kind of going through and, and looking at all the data and saying, you know what, here's your differential diagnosis. Here are the things that you should consider. And for the person, if you're not a hundred percent, looking at it and say, oh, wait, yeah, maybe I should order that test. I thought about it, but I didn't. But then having the computer say, hey, I, yeah, I, I would to, do it. Yeah. And then you're like, all right, let's 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 do that. And I think it would save lives, you know, and not, nothing against humans. I mean, we are human. We make yeah. errors. And unfortunately, medicine, we're not allowed to make errors. And so, you know, I, I see us being very more efficient, uh, helping patients more. And I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm really stoked. And I'm kind of glad that I'm I'm at the age that I am so that when I am uh, retired and, and needing uh, more health care, that these things will be there. It'll be ironed out by the time you need it, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm hoping. <laughs> um, so somebody that's interested in the, in the book itself, like what, what's kind of the, the main driving point behind the book that you'd want readers to, to walk away with? Yeah, my main goal is to start the conversation, kind of go through it jump around different chapters, you know, I have some fun hacks in the back. Just honestly, just look at it and just educate yourself. Because the more you educate yourself, the more you're like, huh, I could use this technology, or I'm going to talk to my doctor, or maybe you're a hospital administrator, and you're like, huh, I think we could use XYZ. Obviously, there's barriers. Um, and that takes it to the next step. I created a little LinkedIn group called ChatGPT and healthcare in LinkedIn. And my goal is simple just bring people into the forum and have people talk about these things. So that way the computer programmers are there, the lawyers are there, doctors are there, uh, patients are there, but then everybody's talking to move the, the needle forward. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, we're getting near the bottom here. I, I always ask, like, if there's one or two main points and you might've already covered it here, it sounds like if there's one or two main points, you'd want a listener of this show to walk away with thinking specifically about one building, building a business that's patient centric or a healthcare practice that's patient centric and then leveraging technology in it. What, what would that big overarching idea be for them? You know, one humbling thing is, you know, depending on your personality type, we all want to do it all. We all have that type A, but it's important to realize you can't do it all. So my last advice is make sure you have a mentor, make sure kind of like marriage, make sure you find someone that's going to compliment you in the business and ideally find that one person that is the opposite of you that can complement your idea. That way, when you go into business, you know that you got your box and this other person has the other and together you have the mission. Awesome. Well, Dr. Castro, um, thanks so much for being on the show. Where can people find out about you, the book, all of your work, all, all the places? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I am on all the social major social media. Uh, just go in and type in forward slash Harvey Castro MD, and that's on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. 
And then um, as far as the book, uh, same thing. You can just type in Harvey Castro MD in Amazon and any book that I write will show up. I have several books on there. I have one about how to be successful in life. And the last one is this one we just talked about. Awesome. Cool deal. Well, thanks so much, Doc. Have a good, uh, have a good weekend. Have a good one. Thank you for your time. And thanks yeah. for joining us all. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Castro. This is one of those conversations where probably we could have busted that up into two or three different podcast episodes in and of themselves just because of the breadth of the topics, right? It's it's not every day that you meet a, well, not just a physician, but a healthcare professional in general who has, who has done a lot like that, right? Has built this chain of, of clinics, still delivered very much personalized, individualized, patient-centered care, sold those businesses, and now is working in, in healthcare technology. So I feel like we could have broken this episode up into you know, one interview just on the the whole aspect of build, building the the seven clinics that were under one brand and then selling them and how he went about training and, and putting the systems in place to make it an organization that was attractive to a, a potential uh, acquiring organization. We could have made it a second episode on the whole patient-centered care thing. And I love that he was talking about how you know, they would do things for homeless people that were coming in into the clinics, even if it was at some point not quote unquote produ productive, right? It, it didn't meet productivity standards, but they were doing the right thing by people. Um, and ultimately, I've, al I've always said this, the people that go into healthcare, as a general rule, people go into healthcare because they feel at some level that the, it's their way of playing, to quote Paolo Coelho and the alchemists, like, it's their role to play in the history of the world, or it's it's their vocation or their calling. It's much more than just a a job. Now, obviously, there are people that get into healthcare because they were told that there's always going to be sick people, there's always going to be injured people. So, it's job security. You're always going to have something to do. There's always going to be somebody that needs healthcare. But the vast majority of people are looking for that safe, secure, stable job, but they're also wanting to do something more than just crunch numbers all day, right? They want to do, most people want to do work that is meaningful at the end of the day and feels like it's making an impact in the greater society, right? You want to be able to contribute to your fellow man and to society in general. And healthcare really is a, is a place where that's still possible. I mean, yeah, I know there's a lot of problems in healthcare, specifically, <laughs> specifically here in the U.S. with the way that we've got the payment model set up and regulatory involvement and all that kind of stuff, um, much of which I talk about in the book, Better Outcomes, A Guide to Humanizing Healthcare. Shameless plug there. You can find that on Amazon. The audio and audible book should be coming out in the next uh, couple weeks. So look out for that. We'll send you an email if you're on the email list. But um, so the idea of, of taking what really was a successful business. It was growing, it was profitable, and they were still able to be patient-centered. So that could have been its own topic in and of itself. And then the final topic would have been that whole chat GPT, artificial, uh, artificial intelligence technology and its role that it can potentially play in the improvement of clinical decision-making, workflows, uh, clinical operational guidelines, all of that kind of stuff as well. Um, so anyways, one of the things that really stuck out to me when uh, listening back to this conversation again with Dr. Castro is his point that the, the technology should never replace clinical judgment. We're not saying it's going to replace a clinician. It's not going to replace a doctor or a physical therapist or anything like that. But what it can do is really be the almost this the starting point for a, a meaningful and in-depth conversation with with a physician right like i know we i've had this several times and i'm sure you've had this too in the clinic even now that i'm only treating a couple days a week i still get, i still get it every now and then but you get a patient that comes in and they they're referred to you for xyz diagnosis and they've done the research right they they came in with uh, sheets printed from webmd or from google or, or from wherever and they're, you know, maybe they have some mis, uh, mismatched expectations or understanding about what the condition and the diagnosis or the possibility is. 
and it's time for a conversation, right? I love having those conversations, but th those patients might get written off sometimes as difficult or, oh man, they're coming in with all this stuff. But the reality is those are the conversations and those are the patients that you really have the, the potential to make a big impact just in the way that you communicate and the way that you provide education about their condition, their diagnosis, their prognosis, possible outcomes, all of that. The ability for something like chat GPT or some kind of artificial intelligence chat bot or something like that that can basically assimilate all this information that's out there and put it hopefully more coherently than you could get from just a blanket Google search um, really takes that patient and gives them a little bit more information, gives them a little bit more power in that conversation, if you would. They, they're armed with more information and it's more specific information. So the conversation that you have with this patient now becomes less of laying the groundwork. I don't know how many of you have had this conversation with a patient where they come in and they've got these, you know, 15 pages printed from WebMD or from, you know, what are the other, the big search engines? And it's like totally wrong. And you've got to go back to the drawing board and you're laying down the, the basics. Something like an artificial or an AI driven information synthesis system, which is essentially what, what chat GPT can be, can really put the patient in a position where they're farther along in that educational or understanding journey so that the conversation that you have with them is much more fruitful and takes much less time to get there. <laughs> so anyways, that's those are my thoughts on that. If you like the show, head on over to iTunes, leave us a rating and review. It helps people find us. Um, you can head on over to www.betteroutcomes.show to catch all the latest episodes, uh, sign up for the email list, find us on your favorite pod app, you know, iTunes, Google Play, all those places, all the buttons are there. And there's also a feature on the betteroutcomes.show website that allows you to send over a video question. So I'm trying this out in 2023. A friend of mine developed this um, develop this platform. It looks like it has really the, uh, just a cool way to interact with folks. So you can shoot me over a question, anything about the show, about the episodes, uh, maybe a topic, a potential topic for a, um, for a future episode and we'll get it in the line. And the nice thing about the, the ask answer platform is that you shoot me over a video question and I can shoot you back a video response. So something pretty cool. Head on over to betteroutcomes.show to do that. And Last plug, if you are a clinic owner, uh, manager, departmental administrator, and you are looking for a system that helps both attract, acquire, engage, and retain patients, but doing it in a way that establishes real meaningful relationships with your patients and clients, head on over to rehabupracticesolutions.com and check out what we can do for you. Um, I love working with, with healthcare organizations specifically around this idea of, okay, we want to build a business that's successful, obviously. We want a marketing plan that works, obviously. But how do we do it in a way that isn't impersonal? We want to make sure that by the time patients arrive at the clinic or at the organization, that they have a preliminary relationship established. And we want to work on the back end so that once they're there in the clinic, that we're reinforcing that. We're building that relationship deeper so that these patients are more likely to adhere to their plans of care, uh, which means they're going to be more likely to achieve their goals, um, decrease their risk of adverse events and all that kind of stuff. Um, and that all starts with what I call a bottom-up process of care, both on the front end business development side and then on the back end service delivery side. So if you're interested in learning more about that, again, www.rehabupracticesolutions.com. That's rehab, the letter U, practicesolutions.com. Until the next time, be safe, be healthy. I will talk to you then. Thanks for listening to the Better Outcomes Show, where we explore the possibilities of a new healthcare. Our hope is that you walk away from each episode informed, equipped, and empowered to push the boundaries in your own practice or business. We want to give you the tools to help you build strong, long-lasting relationships with your patients and clients, helping meet their goals, improve their health, and achieve better outcomes. Learn more at www.rehabupracticesolutions.com. We'll catch you on the next episode.